Welcome to On The Level, broadcasting from the Blue Ocean Network studios here in Beijing. My name is Fergus Thompson. Now, over the past decade, uh, it's become increasingly common to hear reports of Chinese money flowing into Hollywood and more US films being made here in China. And given the lean few years that the ancestral home of movie making has seen recently, uh, perhaps this is the answer to everyone's prayers. In addition to that, China provides a potential market of hundreds of millions of people eager to spend their expanding income on luxuries, such as movie theatre tickets. So, is this a match made in heaven? Could it be so simple? Well, the answer to those questions is generally no, but uh, to make sure and to get a more nuanced view of the apparently torrid on-screen romance between the Chinese and American movie industries, I'm delighted to be joined today by a top Hollywood producer and someone uh, who has more than one movie project in China under his belt, uh, Bennett Walsh. Welcome to On The Level. Thank you for having me. Nice to be here. Um, you go generally by E. Bennett Walsh in my, IMDb. My, and yes, screen, my right? screen credit is E. Bennett Walsh, okay. but everybody calls me Bennett. Right, okay. Well, I'll do the same then. Yeah. The E, no doubt, standing for excellent. Uh, Ebenezer, because oh. I'm so cheap <laughs> as a producer. First, before we look at China, the US, and the movies back and forth, how does one become a producer? And perhaps more importantly, what does a producer actually do? Hmm. That's a loaded question. Um, I've been in the industry now 30 years, so when I actually went to film school, I wanted to be a director, which I think everybody sort of goes into film school thinking that. And I found out that, you know, I wasn't as creative as I thought, but... Um, we all do. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and I enjoyed problem, problem solving. And, and the process, I actually started off being a cameraman, and I didn't like just the shooting period, but I liked building the project up and then doing the post-production, the whole process, as well as really the problem solving. And I think in Hollywood, to answer your question about what a producer does, mm -hmm. Hollywood, we've been making movies for over a hundred years and I think that, that we've become very, very specialized. So, for instance, what I do, which is a line producer, is the day-to-day -day producer or the producer that, that as soon as a director is hired, I get brought on and I follow through with the director. So managing the budget, figuring out the schedule, and then delivering the picture. Mm -hmm. Where my partner is typically the creative producer who actually develops the script, which could be for years, gets the director, and then I take it over from there. So there's probably three different types of producers, creative producer, business producer, and then the person that, that finances it. Right. So. That's what you do all day, uh, uh, going to where you do it. You're here in China at the moment, obviously, for, for, for a project here. We'll talk about that later. But um, you've been here before. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about some of the previous projects you've worked on here. The first time I came here was in uh, 2001, November. Actually, yeah, it's November now. Um, and we did Kill Bill here, which was Quentin Tarantino's uh, film, which we made as, as one film. You know, it, it got split up into two, but... We ended up, uh, he loved the footage so much that it turned out to be a four-hour movie, so he didn't want to cut it down, and he split it in two. And we, when we first did our, our location scout, we thought we were going to go to Tokyo, because it takes place in Tokyo. Yeah. We went to Tokyo, Hong Kong, and Beijing. And when he came to Beijing at that time period, he was so energized by the environment that he's like, I want to do it here. But I posed the question, what we did was basically built everything on stage, which I could have done in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And he was very clear that, yes, I could make this in LA, but it's not gonna give the feel of if I use the crew from Asia. Meaning he wanted a different sort of feeling and he felt that with the crews here, it would. Mm -hmm. And by that process, I mean, it was extraordinary. It was, it was, it was hard because I think last tempta uh, The Last Emperor was the last film, Western film shot here. And, and we were reinventing the wheel. That caused problems with the authorities. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but um, he was very specific. He was like, I, I wanted to ha have a different feel from the crews. Mm -hmm. so, so you were r right at the beginning of this sort of round of, of, of uh, US films being shot here? I don't think there was, yeah. I mean, they came in after. Mm -hmm. After they saw Kill Bill, Holly was, was like, oh, we could do that. Mm -hmm. And then people started to look at it. Mm -hmm. And then you worked on the other side of China, out in the West, on, uh, on the Kite Runner. 
Oh yes, out out in uh, Kashgar. Mm -hmm. That was that was uh, six years later, and and the kite runner was done out in Shenzhen, and in that one we had to find Kabul before the the Russian invasion, so it couldn't be destroyed. And we went to eastern Turkey, we went to Morocco, and then we went to, to Kashgar. And the city was so well preserved, and, and because of the, the Uyghurs looking similar to the Afghans, mm -hmm. uh, it was the best place to shoot the movie, mm -hmm. which was undoubtedly my hardest movie I ever did. Well, hardest movie, were there any particular like, difficult or, or, or rewarding moments from, from, from those you know, working here in China, those movies here in China that were very different from working on a, on a movie in the States? It can be very easy in Los Angeles to make a movie because they, it, the, the industry is so well developed. Mm -hmm. So, so what you're, you're, the problems you're dealing with don't necessarily have to do with the film. Where here, or in other places throughout the world, you're, you're, you're coming here for a reason. So we went to Kashgar for the landscape and the people. There. And that's explained. That's in the far west of China, quite remote. So you're thousands of miles from Beijing. Never mind from from it from, was from Hollywood. Yeah, no, it was three thousand miles from mm -hmm. Beijing. And and um, to 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 build up a crew of five hundred people, that was Uyghur, Chinese, and then international, and actually you know be able to 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 have it functioning mm -hmm. is very rewarding. We went up, we went up to the mountains and, and we had to get kurgits to, to bring down 35 yurts and set them up for a week because there was a particular location that we wanted and there was no hotels. Mm -hmm. But we put up the yurts and we stayed there for a week and then we moved on. What would you say is the most or the main differences between working on one of these productions in, in China with a, a, a Chinese crew as well and working what you might say is a normal U.S. production back in California? Well, I think, I mean, I'm experiencing it now because I'm working on a film with a Chinese director mm -hmm. but with a Western crew. And it's, it's, it's an Eastern approach versus a Western approach. I think that both countries have a rich history of cinema, um, but that 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 the way they view things, you know, is, is very very different. Mm -hmm. So when you combine the two, miscommunication and misinterpretation happens naturally because the point of view is so different. Mm. So it's not just a language problem. No, no, no. The language, the language is is the easy thing to solve. Mm -hmm. It's 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 how you approach things, and and I think in Hollywood we are we we're undoubtedly the most funded, and and I put it, it's an interesting thing because if you look at every other film industry, in Europe, Paris, wherever, it the film industry has always been under the arts, it's always been subsidized, it it was never considered a business first. America was always business first, art second, which then it grew, and, and you can see we make, we, our movies cost millions and millions of dollars. A $10 million budget in Europe is a great budget. For us, we can barely make a movie like that. So China, and, and what's happened in the last few years, has followed that same route, meaning it, it has been business first, and not, it was art before, but now it's taken a, a turn where it's very similar to the American film industry. Well, speaking about budgets and, and, and money going into it, as I mentioned there in the introduction, uh, there are more and more Chinese corporate or individual investors in Hollywood, it seems. Um, uh, Hollywood studios are not known to refuse money. So is this, what could go wrong with this, with this, this involvement from that direction, from money coming from, from Chinese companies or whatever? I'm thinking of places like uh, perhaps, you know, Wang Jianlin, this extremely rich man who's bought the AMC uh, mm -hmm. chain of distributors and seems to be also interested in moving into production. Uh, is it all good or is it positive? Are there drawbacks? Well, you have to look at it from the two sides, meaning from, from the Hollywood side, we have a history of, of, of going through investors and countries every five to ten years. Um, you, you mean changing focus, moving around from one place? Meaning to we'll take money from anybody. 
had, to be honest. <laughs> you know, whether it's, it's, it's from London <clears throat> or when the Japanese bought Universal and, and Columbia Pictures, you know, we, will, we will always take money because we need a lot of money. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that makes Chinese investment different is that from the Chinese side, they want something more than a financial return. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they want a cultural or they want th something that they can bring back and either show here or, but it's, 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 it's not just a straight investment. Sure. There's more of a cultural investment involved. So it's not just the bottom line, there's something more ephemeral or more, or more emotional that they want to bring back. Yeah. Not, something yeah. positive for yeah. China. Yeah. Right. Um, movie theaters in the States, I'm not sure how many screens there are in the, in the, in the States. There's about 40,000 screens. Right. And, 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 and China at the moment, something... I believe it's under 10,000, but I'm okay. not sure. Okay. So, so there's, there's room for potential, and especially China's got a, a much bigger yes, population. number of people to go to those movie theaters. Um, th that... Those, those movie theaters are often being built in third or fourth tier cities. These are these smaller, more yep. remote cities where they're still a novelty. Uh, ten years ago, I, I remember driving through a small town in China and seeing a movie projected from one side of the road onto a house wall on the uh. other. Now we're uh -huh. looking at movie theaters that are equivalent to what are in the States or Europe. Do you think, as it seems to have happened in the States, there's a stage when the novelty might wear off and those thousands and thousands of movie theaters are going to be half or full or full completely empty or is that too I, far away i think that's too far away i think i think that if you look at the states at 40,000 screens you know people are still going to the cinema where there's a lot of people analyzing the fact okay we're in decline in the states and certainly because of, of social media and, and different sort of you know, entertainment outlets, mm -hmm. people don't go to the movies as much as they, they used to. For instance, the under 20-year-old boys used to be an easy sell. We could sell them anything. They barely go to the movies now, you know, and that's in the last five years. So right now in China, the decision maker is the the under you know the thirty to forty year old uh, woman. She makes the decisions, and and that's the driving force in the box office right now in China. So it will change, mm -hmm. you know, as it grows. But I think there's a lot of room for growth because you can go up to forty, fifty thousand screens and still sustain, you know, people going to the movies. And, and let's make it clear that going to the movies in China is not necessarily a cheap option, especially given the difference in, in, in income. So you're paying similar prices or more than you would sometimes yeah. to, to the US, even though people are earning a lot less. Well, and 3D and IMAX is, is also a reason to go. So it's, it's very much an outing, where mm. I think in the States, it's not as much of an outing as it once was. Mm -hmm. And still very much here, a couple's thing as well. You'll see couples going to the movies like you imagine in the States in the 60s and the yeah. 70s. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's a lot of theatres and a lot of potential for growth, but not everybody gets to show their movies in those theatres, particularly foreign productions. Um, and that's a sort of a complication in China. Uh, to get a movie release is, is not always straightforward. The MPAA, the, the Motion Picture Association of, this, of America chair, Chris Dodd, back in 2011, took a sort of a confrontational stance with, with, the, with the Chinese authorities saying, look, WTO was signed and this is da, 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 et cetera. Um, at that time, you took a more softly, softly approach and suggested this was not the way to approach it and you'd already be worked in China. Do you think now, three or four years later, your sort of, uh, your approach has been justified? It's, it's, I think it's hard to tell, except that, that we've gone from, you know, 20 to 24 pictures in the States to 30. In right. The last Just day. explain so that situation of 20 to 24, that cap. Well, there's, there's, there's this quote of how many shows can come in that are not co-productions. So um, there are 30 movies that come in. What type of movies do they want to bring in? Movies that will fill IMAX and 3D, which means it's our, our larger tentpole movies instead of smaller, you know, intimate movies that don't fit that platform. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but I think I probably I probably took the softer approach because the industry was growing, and as the industry grows here, they they need more product if product isn't being made here, and it can sustain so it's not lopsided. Mm-hmm. If if you were allowed to bring in anything. I think that the the industry here wouldn't grow. Mm-hmm. In the last three or four years, just production here um, has 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 grown and matured phenomenally. I remember five years they never used to talk about script or script development, and now they talk about that. Before they used to start a production with a treatment, and then figure it out. But they they're they're more and more doing what we do in Hollywood, which is really develop and and do pre production. Mm-hmm. So, and that's great to see, because there are so many stories here to be told, and, and, and what, from a Western perspective, we can't tell every story. Meaning, the Chinese perspective is unique and different, and there's a place for that. This co-production system that you mentioned means that if you team up with a Chinese production company, you're exempt from that cap, so you have yes. the right to show here. Uh, we did see a number of films which seemed to be sort of pushing the envelope there and making a nod to the Chinese audience by maybe including a Chinese star in a Chinese version mm. who was later cut out or, or filming something in Tiananmen Square and uh, calling it a co-production. Uh, are the audiences, first of all, are the audiences here wise to that? And secondly, did the government get wise to that as well and insist on what you would say would be a real co-production? Well, <clears throat> I think there's there's... You know, there's two types of co-productions. I mean, the, the the most fundamental is is one where it's co-financed, and also the material is is has a source back to China. The other type is where it's purely financial, but that that they're sharing in the revenue and and it's an, a real investment, which isn't wrong. So if you have a movie that that doesn't take place at all in China, but that they're investing 50% in it. It's 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 getting it's maturing the market. So I don't think it's wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, they're just two different approaches. Mm-hmm. The the there was uh, I think it was one of the Transformer movies which had sort of bits. The last here. Transformers. Last Transformers. But it wasn't that wasn't a co-production. Oh, I see. They, that they, was more for the to, to grab the. The Chinese interest. And it, it was. It was. It was. It was. It was to grab the Chinese audience and nice. and 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 have it. If you take the last Transformers, at the very end, the military support that you know was was added and 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 for the most part was in the background was Chinese. From the American audience, they didn't even notice, but from the Chinese audience, they were like, "Oh wow, they're part of the story." Sure. And. It made it made a ton of money here. And that's why American audiences might be surprised sometimes to see references to strange brands that they've never heard of, but which are actually huge brands here in China. I made the Amazing Spider-Man two, and we were in Times Square for a sequence, and we had product placement from a Baijiu company. <laughs> and the, they, the they American the American audience didn't notice it at all. Yeah. They need all the product placement. I think get they did. <laughs> In terms of, of making money, I mentioned this company, Wanda, uh, and Wang Jianlin, who, has, who, who bought this uh, AMC chain. He's also invested here in China, eight, something like $8 billion, I think it is, in this um, movie theme and theater uh, and studio complex, in which Qingda. is supposed to head in, in, in Qingda. Um, is this like trying to build a new Hollywood in China, and, and is, is anything much happening there? Because he did bring in all these stars, the great and the good of Hollywood came over, and were well, presumably paid to come over, and uh, said hello, and this is great. And then, since then, I don't know if there's been much going on. Is this somewhere where, where movies are going to be made here, rather than the traditional studios? Well, that's, well, that's two, two questions. One is, is, why is he doing it? Mm. That is, is mostly a real estate you know, answer because he's anchoring a big entertainment complex with a portion of it being studios. So the studio becomes advertising for people to go there. And then there's the hotels, there's the amusement park. Um, so I think 
that's smart because because people here want to have leisure, whether it's leaving the country or going there. Mm -hmm. So that's fair. Now, whether or not we're going to make movies there, right now, people do not make movies in L.A. Why? Because they go to other places that are cheaper. Whether it's Atlanta or Beijing, depending on the script, I can certainly make a movie cheaper in Beijing than in L.A. Mm -hmm. um, so if people are going to go to Qingdao, it will always become a financial question. Is it cheaper and can we get what we want by going there? The average Chinese moviegoer can probably reel off 10 or 12 US or, or, or foreign overseas stars. An American moviegoer, not, a, f not a, a movie buff, but the average moviegoer might get stuck at Jackie Chan in the other direction. But I think, but I think if, you, if, if you take, a, take the example of, say, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, right. that was a worldwide hit. And everybody knows who Zhang Ziyi is. So it goes back to, are the films good? and are people going to see them? People know who Gong Li is, but that's only because the movies that she's been in, people have gone and see. So it really just comes down to, to whether the movies are good or not. Do you think that there's a hunger amongst Chinese actors at the top level, the A-list people, to, to move into the international market as, let's face it, few have done. You mentioned Gong Li. Jackie Chan has sort of been doing it for years and from Hong Kong, uh, maybe Chow Yun Fat. But the others, there are a lot of big stars here who people may have heard of their names vaguely, but are, do they want to get into that market? Is it like a, a small, a big fish in a small, well, China's not a small pond, but you know yeah. what I mean? That they, they, they're very well known here, household names, but really they can walk around Los Angeles and nobody looks at them. Yeah. Is there that hunger? I don't know because the, the talent fees, the cast salaries, they're being paid well for doing local films. So, so it really just becomes an artistic choice if they want to challenge themselves. But or, I don't or think... Or ambition to be more widely known, perhaps. I don't see that. Mm -hmm. I actually don't see that. I think I, think, I, think I see more that, 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 you know, certainly if they don't speak English, they're going to be more comfortable acting in their local language. Sure, that, that, that's a problem of this, the language. If they are going to make it, it's more likely they'll have to learn English in, in, in a re to a reasonable extent anyway, and, that, and that's a barrier that's going to hold some people back. Do you think we'll ever reach the stage where um, we'll see American actors wanting to act in Mandarin, learning it to the extent that they can uh, actually take part in a film that's shown in China? and become Absolutely, China? absolutely, because I think if... if, if if actors are not getting jobs in the States, they're going, to, they're going to try to market themselves here. And I think they will absolutely try. And, and, and if they're able to do it reasonably well, I think they will. I mentioned that you're currently here on a project um, uh, which is taking place, you're filming here in China. It's, it's, it's called The Great Wall. Everybody knows the Great Wall, but apart from that, what more can you tell us about that? What's, what's uh, about? It's, it's so I'm developing a film with with uh, Johnny Mo, and and who's a master director here. Uh, the Great Wall takes place in the Song Dynasty, which is 12th century, and it is an action adventure film. It's it's meant to appeal both in China and the States, but play throughout the world. So not not historical drama or, or sticking closely to no. No, it's, 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 it's a story of, of two Western mercenaries coming into the Silk Road and, and through a series of mishaps, they, get, uh, they, they trip and go to the wall and they find out the true meaning of the wall. Right, which we'll have to wait, wait and for see. the movie to find out what it is. Um, are movies like this in China of comparable budgets to the to the ones filmed in the United States? Or does that, does that, as you mentioned earlier, being able to make it cheaper make a, make a big difference? Local Chinese films are on par with, say, Europe, where they're between two to ten million dollars US. Um, ours, because it needs to be a, a, a broad appeal film, will, will be in excess of a hundred million US, and it will be the largest film ever done here. Right, so it's, it's aimed definitely at the, at the international market yes. and also at the Chinese market. Yes, yes. So you want it all. Yes. 
That's the goal. <laughs> right. The, uh, there's, a, there's a company here, I believe they're involved in this, called Legendary East. Um, is this one of these companies that's, that's set up to focus on co-production specifically, or are they just looking at making films for the Chinese market, or for the Western market, or, or is it a mixture of all of people? It's a mixture. It's a mixture, knowing that, that Legendary East is, is trying to uh, more profoundly make films and TV shows that work here. I think that, that if you, in, in just the last year in Hollywood, they only used to report the U.S. box office and the international box office. And in the last year, when you wake up on Monday morning, you got the U.S., you got the China, and then you got the international. So it is now becoming that specific in terms of... of, of and that important that they actually produce yeah. those figures separately. Yeah. yeah. The, um, we've seen, as I said, you've been involved in several of these films, films made in China, either co-productions, either set in China in some way, or they are made here because it suits it, they're not necessarily Chinese. Uh, what about the other direction? Is there a possibility that we're going to see at some stage large numbers uh, of Chinese movies being made in the United States, the opposite of what's happening at the moment? I'm thinking recently there was one starring a famous actress here, Tang Wei, um, Mr. Finding Mr. Right or something. Mm -hmm. I think it was I saw the film. It was okay. it was not a bad film. And it was it was set, as far as I know, mainly in Seattle. Seattle. Yeah. Is that is that a trend we're going to see more of? Yes. Um, and you can look at two things. It, it, if if going to the movies is a leisure activity, then what is you know the Chinese population doing? They're traveling overseas. They're going to places they never have been before. They're, they're, they're looking to, to have experiences that are outside of just working all the time. So with that, you know, they're making the movies in other places. They're in Europe. They're in the States. Um, because it's something that the Chinese audience can now connect with. Five years ago, if you put a story in, in, in Europe or in New York, they wouldn't connect to it. Now, they have an experience of being there so they can relate to the story. So it will happen more and more. One thing that also has to be asked is when you're coming here to make a movie, and this comes up in the States regularly, what sort of pressure are you going to come under to either change storylines or put something in or taking out because of the situation of... Uh, well, it's Chinese. very clear because you can't, you, you can't make a movie here without getting in a film permit. And when you submit your, your application with the script, they go through the script and they tell you if they have any issues. So is it censorship? Of course it is. But that's the cost of doing business here. Is there a lot of negotiation involved in that? Or is it, that's it, we're going? Or is there a, is there a sort of a, a, a fluid line there? I think there is. The, my experiences have always been doing non-Chinese films, mm -hmm. meaning one was set in Afghanistan, one was set in Japan. This is my first project where it's actually China for China. So I, I think everybody knows loosely what you can't sort of approach in a story but if something pops up because of current issues or whatever there you, you have the ability to change it mm -hmm. and turning away from everybody else and looking more at, at you personally do you see yourself uh, coming back to china after this project is finished and and making more movies here it's a lot of fun making movies here it's 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 where where I think in Los Angeles, it's it, the Los Angeles, the Hollywood film industry is is a little bit in 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 retraction, meaning it's 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 not as robust as it has been. Where here, it's it's very positive, it's growing, and it's a lot of fun to make movies here. So I hope so. Well, continue having fun, Bennett yeah. Walsh. Thanks for coming. No, thank you. It's a pleasure.